Okay, it is time to start, and I believe we have a quorum. We'll start off this uh, Fort Ord Reuse Authority workshop and regular meeting for Friday, September 8, 2017. Uh, can we have uh, our Director Edlin lead us in the pledge, please? Thank you. All right, um, we'll, we'll have acknowledging, acknowledgments, announcements, and correspondence. Mr. Hulamark. Yes, uh, Chair, members of the board, I have uh, several announcements to make. Uh, first of all, under a general announcement, uh, we did uh, participate actively in a conference call this morning with uh, members of the the United, uh, the United States Congress, both the Senate and the House of Representatives uh, Chief of Staff for the Armed Services Committees and the Association of Defense Communities Leadership. And during that call, we talked quite a bit about the proposed additional round of base realignment and closure that's been submitted by Senator McCain for consideration. That report is getting quite a bit of activity in the Washington DC area and it's calling for a report back by 2019 on potential uh, realignment and closure activities. At your desk I have a summary of that bill that was submitted so you can look at that in the future. I know uh, directors Adams and Garfield and I do not see Alexander here but participated in a quite a bit of discussions about base realignment and closure just this past June. I know uh, Director uh, Morton also heard of this a couple of years ago. So there's quite a, there's a summary there for anyone who'd like to take a look at that. Under upcoming events, uh, next week the Army is going to initiate its efforts for this year's potential for a burn by doing some clearance and so the prep work will be occurring. So for those of you that see that acti activity out in the field, that's the preparation work for the potential so that we can use uh, fire to clear areas in order to remove dangerous munitions from the Fort Ord National Monument and other areas. On September the 12th there will be a prevailing wage workshop that's going to be hosted by the Department of Industrial Relations. It'll be next door or actually not next door, it'll be in this room. Um, it'll be at the uh, it starts at 8.30 in the morning on the 12th of September. There have been quite a bit of activity and questions about the new legislation, and so uh, at your request, our request, uh, DIR is hosting this event. I think we already know most of the jurisdictions here are participating. Uh, there may, and I know several of the unions are participating, and we've heard several of our developers are here. So September 12th at 8.30. Also on September 12th, City Marine is hosting a public outreach meeting for Imgen Parkway widening project, and that I think all of you might want to participate in that. That's going to be at Vince DiMaggio Park, as I understand it. Um, on September 27th, our ESCA remediation program is conducting for the United States Army a proposed plan for a Group 1 uh, special event. Public comment period is running from 9.15 through 10.16 for that event, and the actual plan is going to be published on September 15th. In terms of recent past events in this room, uh, last uh, two weeks ago, the Monterey Bay Economic Forum was conducted, and uh, I think several of you participated. Um, and I know there were over 50 elected officials that participated in that event uh, just a couple of weeks ago. On August the 30th, the Army and the Monte Monterey County Sheriff's Office held a signing ceremony uh, down the street at the Veterans Transition Center here in Marina for the PAYS program, the Army's Partnership of Youth Success Program. And that was a, a great signing ceremony that provided the, off, the kickoff of that program. And then on September 3rd, just a couple of days ago, the Dignity and Remembrance ride, Epic Ride was uh, started at the California Central Coast Veterans Cemetery. And uh, thank you to uh, Assemblymember Stone and Congressman Panetta for helping to kick that off. Very good. Um, the next item on the agenda is the transportation workshop, which we're all just so excited to to see and hear. We're all here ready to hear that. Uh, so, uh, Michael? Yes, uh, Chair and members of the board, 
Uh, in turn, just to kind of set a little bit of the stage for this event, I wanted to make a few opening comments because this particular workshop was requested, I think, primarily by members of the board who were new to the board, but also by Supervisor Parker in trying to get a kind of refresher for the board to understand the importance of our capital improvement program and the transportation elements. But it's important to point out that FORA was created through state of California law to plan, finance, facilitate, and otherwise oversee the economic recovery of the Monterey Bay region from the impacts of the 1964, 1994 Fort Ord closure. That closure prompted dreams and plans for redeveloping Fort Ord for essential jobs and supportive housing. And over the last 22 years, those concepts and designs have moved closer and closer to achieving reality. And this past year, our annual accomplishments exceeded our recovery projections. We've only done that twice. So we were pretty proud of that. Uh, yes, there have been many moments of serious concern about when the economic development would be realized. But today, we're witnessing the physical metamorphosis envisioned when the 1997 base reuse plan was adopted to guide this journey. Since 1994, we experienced successful establishment of educational facilities in California State University, Monterey Bay, Monterey Peninsula College, Monterey Peninsula Unified School District, York School, uh, Chartwell School, Monterey Bay, uh, uh, um, Monterey College of Law, and many other uh, educational uses on the base. And even the University of California has been able to complete uh, facilities for the Education Science and Technology Center. These uh, educational reuses form the basis of the reuse theme, which is going to be supported by our environmental conservation and our economic recovery programs of job creation. So we're proud of our commitment to retain two-thirds of the former base for recreational and preserved open space, which combined, this offers opportunities for plans and facilities for improved beach access, trail systems for hiking and biking, equestrian areas, and various sports facilities and preserved habitat. But there's significant work remaining to finalize the habitat conservation plan to assure long-term funding. We still have requirements tied to the remediation program for long-term stewardship. And both of those requirements programs require substantial local and federal coordination and funds. The recovery demands generating revenue for completing all of these systems and activities, especially the trail systems, the roads, the transit facilities, water and sewer, other utility systems, all of which meet our CEQA obligations that were adopted under the base reuse plan. And you'll hear more detail about that from Jonathan Brinkman, Steve Ensley, and from our colleague Debbie from Transportation Agency for Monterey County. So as you have directed under the on-base first policy that the board confirmed this past July, the road network will still require a substantial amount of revenue and a substantial amount of work in the coming decade, all of which are going to require continuing the Fort Ord Reuse Authority's board commitment for that comes along with innovation, flexibility, persistence, and the stewardship to meet those obligations. So it's my point that today to re all remain optimistic about we will, what we will accomplish. And next 33 months and 22 days, there are significant things that we have to face. There's a transition facing us after that time. And what regar regardless of what path that takes, the recovery, and especially the capital program, will continue to have a regional focus and a cross-jurisdictional focus that affects both state agencies, local jurisdictions, conservation agencies, and others. So for many of you, this workshop will be a refresher course. Some of you have been on the board a decade or more and have a full concept understanding of what the capital improvement program is and how the transit and transportation facilities have been included in every capital improvement program for a while. There are others here, however, who've only been on the board less than a year. In fact, 40% of our board has been on less than that time period. And so the idea today would be to provide as much background information, Steve and Jonathan will do that, so that the board members are working from an equitable or an equal level of policy understanding, technical understanding, and background 
so that the policy discussions and decisions can be made in an informed way. Steve. Good afternoon, members of the board. Uh, the approach today is meant to be uh, no action taken by the board, so just presentation by the two agency staffs, and uh, then we hope ample time for the public and for board members to both ask questions and to make comments. Uh, the uh, presentation has been put together by uh, your forest staff, uh, which is a mix of uh, people with engineering, planning, uh, background, engineering and planning backgrounds, and also uh, we allowed even one lawyer to help us with it. So uh, it's a, a bit of uh, different languages that are sometimes used by those different disciplines, and. Uh, so uh, what we were hoping that we could accomplish today is to really uh, dig deeper into kind of what all uh, this means and give you an opportunity in a somewhat no harm, no foul uh, context uh, to uh, get the background that you're going to need to uh, work your way through a fairly busy work plan for 2018. The uh, overview of uh, what we're going to present today is uh, Jonathan is going to give you a little bit of the history and background, including dates and history, significant events, uh, and uh, then he's going to work through uh, the major uh, CEQA, California Environmental Quality Act, uh, actions that have been taken. The main context there is that you have a uh, program level CEQA that has been accomplished uh, over the years in uh, the enacting of the base reuse plan and preparation of EIRs and documents of that nature. And then that invariably uh, segues into a project le level CEQA process, which uh, you're going to be, uh, you, you've been doing all along during the course of this uh, for a program, but uh, there will be some significant uh, events of that nature next year as well. So we're attempting to just lay a, a framework for you, and uh, we can, uh, in months that follow, uh, begin to build on that information. Then uh, we're also going to go through a little bit about just the project status of, of the different road projects and uh, what, what's been accomplished, what is yet to be accomplished. And uh, then we will hand over uh, the podium to uh, the folks from TAMSI, and they will make a presentation on their uh, 2018 Regional Impact Fee Study and other TAMSI-related uh, items. And then I will come back at the end and just discuss a little bit about uh, future considerations and uh, the 2018 work plan and what we expect uh, to be bringing back to you next year. So I think with that, we'll have Jonathan come up and begin. Chair Rubio, Chair Rubio and members of the board, uh, I want to take you first in a time machine going back into uh, what the base was pre-closure. Uh, so the Army had its uh, transportation network on the base. It had specific purposes for that network. Uh, included serving um, an urbanized footprint, which primarily housed soldiers um, and provided areas for them to recreate and um, have mess halls, etc. And then uh, that was primarily sh shaped by an orthogonal grid, so that was a tightly held roadway stru um, grid structure at, built at 90 degree angles. And then there was uh, also transportation routes out to the training areas, so. So that was an internally focused network that was the transportation network pre-closure. Pre and there were barriers to that would limit or control access on the base. So there were gates at Light Fighter, uh, 12th Street, and other uh, gates around the base. And this is more of a visual representation of that. Uh, so the base was much of an island to itself transportation, uh, the local traffic, the regional traffic going from the Salinas Valley to the Monterey Peninsula 
and vice versa, would have to travel around the base. Roughly go, two routes were, two primary routes were Highway 1 going north to Reservation Road to Blanco Road and into Salinas. Another route was a southern route, primarily along Highway 68. So moving along, as the community after base closure uh, looked at the base use planning that could occur on Fort Ord, this began in the 90s, the community looked, took an opportunity to plan the Fort Ord transportation network and in a way that would integrate with the local community. So a number of objectives included to meet base use plan mitigation requirements, to support regional economic recovery, to establish a network to the municipal standards, to increase connectivity with the surrounding communities, and to provide regional transportation benefits, um, not just to motorized vehicles, but also for transit and bicycle and pedestrians. And as four-door develops, to have acceptable levels of service that are maintained within the network. So here are some of those dates uh, Steve referred to uh, that were important milestones and major policy um, decisions at times for the board. And uh, so from 1994 to 1996, that's when the four-door planning process really incorporated these concepts of connecting some of the traffic fl fl flow from the Salinas Valley to the Monterey Peninsula. And then in 1997, uh, the board, after following a CEQA process, adopted the 1997 base reuse plan it's EIR, and this included mitigations, and traffic was one of those mitigations. Uh, and then in 1997, uh, the four door transportation study allocated for his share, percentage share of the, the network uh, as part of those mitigation measures, which has been subsequently followed up uh, because periodically FOR is required to check in with uh, TAMC and coordinate on monitoring the traffic levels. So that followed up in 2005 with the TAMC for a fee reallocation study. There was another touch base in 2012 with the for base use plan reassessment. And then in just this year, 2017, the for a fee reallocation study, which was coordinated with TAMC. So showing here a, a map of the build out transportation network. Uh, this was part of the base use plan in 1997. It was before the resource constrained reuse plan. So this was the 70,000 population. And just to point out here a few of the connections. So there are east-west connections, uh, Imogen Parkway uh, in Marina going from east to west. Uh, we also have Reservation Road and Blanco, which are part of that. And then we have uh, Inner Garrison Road. That's another east to west, 8th Street, Inner Garrison. And then we have Highway 68 bypass. So that was part of the original network. So there are the major east-west roads. And then the north-south connections, which also facilitate the east to west. Um, we have Highway 1 going through Fort Ord. Uh, we also have 2nd Avenue, a big uh, parallel to Highway 1. General Jim Moore Boulevard, which is the seaside section north to south, and then we have East Side Road and the Fort Ord Expressway. So Fort Ord Expressway would connect with uh, Highway 68 bypass, go north-south to East Side Road, connect with those other east-west facilities. So this was a program level network, and uh, just going to the next, at the 1997 Fort Ord Transportation Study, this, eva this looked at the resource constrained base reuse plan with a population of 37,000. And so there's some key changes here. Uh, we have South Boundary Road no longer in the picture, uh, which is the um, down in Delray Oaks. Uh, we have Giggling Inner Garrison Road connector no longer on the map here. Uh, we have uh, Monterey Road, which is no longer on the, on the map. Um, Co Avenue, uh, Highway 1. Um, modifications, and then um, the Ford Order Expressway, which is no longer on this map. So basic concept, smaller population, less of a transportation network required. So in 2005, uh, as far as required to update its uh, transportation 
uh, study and do um, monitor the transportation levels of service with its CIP with TAMC. We looked at what what could be adjusted on the transportation network. So uh, here are some refinements here. Um, so for coordinating with TAMC and some key changes included South Boundary Road coming back in, Highway 68 bypass removed, and it's roughly replaced with more capacity on General Jim Moore Boulevard and a new plan line for Eastside Parkway, conceptual plan. And then in 2017, um, as we're required to periodically check in with TAMC, uh, they reevaluated the forest CIP and there were a couple of adjustments this time. Uh, this included uh, Del Monte Boulevard extension into Marina. So that's uh, from 2nd Avenue where it terminates at Imjin Parkway going north into Marina and then a broader definition of the Highway 1 improvements um, from Del Monte to Fremont Boulevard and Seaside. So that broader definition would allow for transit and off-ramp, on-ramp improvements to those intersections with the highway, along with widening of the highway. So I uh, just want to cover, uh, in general, the um, environmental review process. So the 1997 base use plan was preceded by an environmental review process. And to describe this, here are just some general aims and functions of CEQA. Um, so in California, we have uh, the C California Environmental Quality Act, and its uh, aim is to have a, a high quality environment now and in the future. And there are certain functions from CEQA that, um, that are fairly important to point out here. So we have from CEQA, it facilitates interagency coordination it increases public participation. It's to inform decision makers about significant environmental effects. Um, it identifies ways environmental damage may be avoided or reduced, or another way to say that is mitigated. And it mitigates environmental damage. So um, part of it is we, in CEQA you disclose to the public why a project is approved even if it leads to environmental damage. So uh, as that is just a, an outline of CEQA, what our process was in 1997, the board adopted the 1997 base reuse plan and environmental impact report. And as part of that, there were mitigation measures. And one was to coordinate with TAMC from time to time. Another was the transportation networks that was uh, for a share of the network to, that was a mitigation measure as part of the plan. So for it had to mitigate for traffic impacts. And so the 1997 four-door transportation study uh, refined the base reuse plan transportation network and it, as a mitigation, assigned trips to on-site, off-site, and regional roads for FORA for development on four-door. And it projected a percentage share that FORA would have and assigned dollar amounts to FORA to mitigate for those impacts. So now that FORA knew what the obligations were, there, was, there had to be a way to fund it. So the four board set up in 2002, a Melrose Community Facilities District. And this is a law in California, government code, and it allows establishment of a geographical area where a property tax or a parcel tax is imposed. And that is a means of obtaining additional public financing. And it pays for public works such as roadways and other public services. So f over the past 20 years, FORA has uh, obtained a number of different funding sources to do its transportation improvements on the base. Uh, we've obtained approximately $72 million in roadway improvement dollars from the Economic Development Administration. And a lot of those grants require local matches. So we were successful in getting state grants. They're, they were called Defense Adjustment Matching Grants. And then FORA also did financing with uh, revenue bonds from different funding sources or borrowing from different assets. And then as part of our four community facilities district, uh, we've collected about $22 million uh, that can be applied towards transportation and transit from the development that's occurred on the base since, cl since closure, since we set up the district. And then from land sales, uh, it funds transportation and other CIP programs, but that's after the building removal obligations are met. And so this uh, is just a quick diagram one to show 
that um, depending on the funding source, there are different obligations that can be applied. So the broader funding source here is the land, are the land sales, which uh, as soon as the land sells from a jurisdiction to a developer, for collects 50% of those proceeds. And from the property taxes, which are based on the assessed value of Fort Ord lands, those have more flexible use of those funds. So they can fund the capital improvement projects, uh, the habitat conservation, the water augmentation, the transportation and transit, and the building removal. So right now the board has prioritized land sales for building removal. On the community facilities district side of this, of this diagram, it's narrow. It can fund the above capital improvement projects, but it's, it wasn't set up to fund the building removal. So uh, now getting to the heart of this presentation, which was the board was interested in looking at what is the, the process for project prioritization and what's the current status of roadways for, for doing priorities. So uh, here's, our, here's our process we have here at FORA. We have uh, the administrative committee, which annually confirms development forecasts. It applies a ranking criteria for the transportation mitigations and it recommends funding priorities to the board. And then the board functions, the board sets the transportation funding priorities so they can take that recommendation or they can modify that recommendations from the administrative committee. And then they approve the annual CIP. And other functions of the board, just going down um, to, in a kind of a more micro or microscope once you have a budget with roadways and, and you've allocated funding to a roadway, well, there's different steps that come back to the board. So design contracts come back to the board for approval. Um, NEPA and CEQA documents come back as part of uh, certifying those documents, approving a project. And then after that stage, construction con contracts come back to the board after solic solicitation processes. And then if there are significant change orders to those construction contracts, those also come back to the board. So just talking about priorities, these are a listing of previous board priorities that have been completed. So the board prioritized these roadways uh, over the past 20 years. This includes um, projects in Marina, including Imogen Parkway, Second Avenue, California Avenue, University and Research Drives, and reservation Road bicycle lane improvements. And then in the county, um, Blanco Road has had improvements that four are funded. In Seaside, General Jim Moore Boulevard, phases one through six. In City of Monterey, Rancho Saucedo Road, connecting South Boundary Road to Ryan Ranch. And then also in Del Rey Oaks, um, General Jim Moore Boulevard and Highway 218 intersection improvements. So uh, this is a tool here to look at, these are the on-site, off-site, and regional projects, these next slides uh, to follow, showing where they are in a process. So essentially, uh, you must complete a CEQA document and certify the CEQA document, approve the project. Then you can go out for a bid solicitation and bring back um, construction contract for, for an award. So to get the ball rolling, you have to start a CEQA process. So this is an update here. So for a, the four board um, certified South Boundary Road and Giggling Road um, CEQA documents in 2010. And so that's shown up here as complete, 100% complete. And so uh, we touch base with the other jurisdictions because there are, there are projects that FORA is lead agency on, and then there's projects that other jurisdictions are lead agency on. So City of Marina is lead agency for the bottom three uh, projects described here and 8th Street was one of the things the board wanted a status on so we've heard back that it's about 35% through a CEQA process and then Abrams is another marina uh, on-site project it's about 10% through a CEQA process and then Salinas Avenue hasn't started yet so that's to give the board a sense of okay which projects are ready for funding at this point so um, off-site projects, this is a status here of, of additional projects in Marina. So um, Crescent Avenue on the top here, it's been fully completed a CEQA process and it's been out to bid. It's actually been, uh, the improvements been put in. 
So uh, Fora will reimburse that as soon as we have an invoice. And then on the Del Monte Boulevard extension to Marina, um, reported back from Marina staff that it's about 10% through a CEQA process. And then Davis Road, south of Blanco, it's been 100% through a CEQA process. Uh, and they're getting the, the bid documents ready for uh, taking out for construction. And then the other off-site roadways uh, haven't started a CEQA process yet. And then finally, here on the regional project status, so Caltrans is the lead agency for these um, state highways, um, Highway 1, uh, Highway 156, and Highway 1 Monterey Road interchange. Uh, so the, the progress here is that Highway 156 is about 75% 75, 75 through uh, a CEQA process. And at that, I will um, turn this over to um, Executive Director Deborah Hale from TAMC. And then um, Mike Zeller will present the next piece after. Thank you. So as, as you can see, TAMC's done a, a lot of the technical um, underpinnings for some of the uh, FORA fee and, and tra traffic analyses, but the FORA Board of Directors has really had the lead role as to how the money gets allocated. Um, so what we're going to talk about is how TAMC um, handles the regional network that surrounds FORA and how we could do a, a better job of integrating that regional network into the base. As was noted, the, the base is still um, in some ways an island. In some ways, it's certainly gotten a lot better, but there's um, priorities that, that need to be addressed. And so Mike's going to talk about how our regional impact fee fits into that and how we could um, integrate some of the off-site and regional projects through some of the work that we're doing. Great. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, Chair, members of the board. I'm Michael Zeller. I'm a principal transportation planner with the Transportation Agency for Monterey County. Um, so just a bit of a primer. I'm sure this is uh, well known to most everybody, but the Transportation Agency for Monterey County, um, our uh, technical uh, denotion is that we're the Regional Transportation Planning Agency for Monterey County. Um, essentially, our charge is to plan, fund, and deliver regional transportation improvements uh, for the county. Um, our board of directors are made up of uh, elected officials from each of the cities as well as the five county supervisors. So many of you um, either sit on our board or your uh, colleagues from your cities um, sit on our board. And we also have five ex officio members uh, made up of Caltrans, uh, Monterey Salinas Transit, the Air District, Airport District, and AMBAG as well. So when we're talking about uh, regional transportation improvements, regional travel, um, it's a, a very uh, varied uh, uh, travel patterns and modes of transportation that we're looking at and trying to solve um, transportation issues. So looking at uh, the agricultural sector in Monterey County uh, being a large contributor to the economy, we're looking at how uh, we can uh, facilitate bringing agricultural goods um, from the Salinas Valley, North County, other parts of the county um, to the market and to the world. Um, bringing visitors and tourists in from outside of the county um, into uh, the peninsula and other attractions, um, how we can serve commuters within the county, going from Salinas and the peninsula, um, South County, North County, and also how we can serve um, students um, going from the Salinas Valley up to Salinas or here at CSUMB or other institutions on the peninsula. And really when we're looking at trying to solve these issues, we're looking at um, all uh, modes of travel to try to address any transportation problems that there are. So looking at um, highway improvements, uh, bus and rail, um, so looking at bringing rail service from Silicon Valley down to Salinas, um, also bicycle and pedestrian improvements with the Sanctuary Scenic Trail, uh, the Fort Ord uh, Regional Trail and Greenway project. We also have the Castorville Overcrossing in North County in construction right now. And with the Measure X, we now have a Safe Routes to School program to look at bicycle and pedestrian improvements more at a local level. Um, but we also, as Jonathan mentioned, uh, do coordinate quite a bit with FORA as well, um, with our focus uh, primarily on uh, planning for regional corridors, um, uh, corridors that serve destinations here in the, the former Fort Ord area, um, so improvements to Highway 1 and increased transit in that area. Um, completing a corridor study recently for Highway 68, and also uh, funding for uh, the uh, Marina to Salinas corridor, so Imgen Reservation in Davis, uh, which is in, uh, moving into, uh, going through design right now and be uh, ready for construction soon. 
Um, we also work closely with FOR on the development of the, the fee study and identifying the transportation impacts and the mitigations that are necessary to um, fund future development in the area. And uh, our main goal, obviously, is uh, looking at comprehensive transportation funding. So rarely is any transportation improvement or a large regional transportation improvement funded by a single um, source of funding. Uh, so we need to look at um, scarce federal funding, uh, different uh, state funding programs, as well as now is, uh, with Measure X more local funding and how we can uh, combine the different guidelines and requirements of all those different programs to identify uh, projects that are eligible um, and uh, secure that funding to deliver projects and make sure that we're meeting the timelines and the uh, deadlines uh, in the requirements of each of those funding uh, programs. Um, so just to, to give an example of that, um, so what we see here is the uh, uh, broad listing of the regional and offsite projects in the FORA capital improvement program. Um, so with Highway 1 listed here, that's the, the Highway 1 widening program as well as the Monterey Road interchange. Uh, we have Highway 156, um, 68 corridor between Salinas and Marina, um, so, sorry, Salinas Monterey. And the Marina to Salinas uh, corridor is the Imgen Reservation Road, Davis Road uh, projects. Um, so as you can see, the four share um, from the um, Community Facilities District for these projects amounts to just a little bit over $62 million. Um, to date, the funding for those projects has been just over $1.3 million. Um, and as you can see, the Transportation Agency also oversees quite a bit of other funding sources that goes towards these projects as well. Um, so the, the TAMC regional fee, uh, state funding through the State Transportation Improvement Program, uh, some local funding from the Regional Surface Transportation Program, then also now a large infusion of funding from Measure X. Um, so as you can see, for all these projects, uh, any one of these sources um, falling through or not um, coming to fruition can create a gap in the funding for these programs, and it can mean either delays or not being able to deliver uh, these projects. Um, so being able to, to zero in on one example for Highway 156, um, here's a, a proposed funding plan for this project to give an example of how um, all these uh, different funding sources play a role in making sure that uh, we can secure these uh, funds are integral to making sure that we can deliver the projects. Um, so for 156, there's about a little over $22 million from the State Transportation Improvement Program, uh, $30 million for Measure X, um, looking at another uh, 81 million from state matching funds and a potential of uh, 214 million from total revenues. And then the four portion of uh, about 17 million. Um, so if uh, any of those uh, do not come through on time or if there's a delay in any of those funding, it can cause either a delay or non-delivery of any of these projects, which um, creates a challenge or if something falls through, it just makes, uh, means that we have to look for sources of funding elsewhere as well. Um, so just to give a, a background on the Regional Development Impact Fee Program, and I'll talk a bit about how this coordinates with the, the FORA program. Uh, the Regional Fee Program was started in 2008, um, updated in 2013. The, the goal of this program is to uh, mitigate uh, cumulative impacts to the regional transportation network. Uh, the way that that's done is that any time a new development uh, comes in for a building permit, they would pay uh, this fee based on the number of new vehicle trips that they generate and then that fee gets applied towards a listing of uh, 12 regionally significant projects. Um, the, uh, the funding is then used to uh, construct those projects as the mitigation for the development. Uh, the fee can only apply to uh, new development or new growth, um, so there is a, an existing deficiency portion that we need to make up through other sources of funding. Um, so if uh, uh, the project is uh, X millions of dollars, the fee can only contribute a certain percentage of that, a small percentage of that, based on uh, the, the new growth. Um, and as I mentioned, it coordinates with uh, local impact fees. So if a city such as uh, Marina has a, a local impact fee for their city streets, if they are collecting fees for something like Reservation Road that's already also in our program, uh, we discount our program so that there's no uh, double counting or double collection on the two programs. Um, the program was set up as a joint powers authority, so all the cities in the county have adopted uh, our fee program and established a joint powers authority with the transportation agency uh, serving as the administering agency and their board serves as the governing board for the JPA. Um, so the basis for our regional fee program is uh, the Nexus study. It's a Nexus-based um, program. 
Um, essentially what that means is that we look at the roadway network deficiencies using the AMBAG's regional travel demand model. Um, looking at uh, two different scenarios. First is, as I mentioned, the existing conditions. So what are the travel patterns and the uh, road conditions in uh, the current year? And then we look at the, uh, the future 20 years down the road to see what the uh, uh, forecast or travel patterns would be based on adopted general plans. Um, so looking at where the different land use patterns, where people are going to be living, working, going to school, and then how people will try to get around the county using the, the roadway network. Um, and that will show us where the future um, uh, congestion will likely be so that we can come up with a list of projects to address that congestion. Um, the, then the fees are based off of the uh, cost of the improvements for those, um, those mitigations. Uh, the, the fee program is broken up into four different zones, um, so it creates a geographic equity where the level of the fee is different in each of the zones based on the amount of growth in that zone, um, along with the amount, uh, the, the cost of the transportation improvement projects in that zone. Um, there's also a, a fifth zone that we have, which is the, the Fora zone, which is essentially a donut hole in our program. Um, since Fora's uh, fee program collects for regional and offsite projects, uh, we have in the past exempted uh, developments in the Fora area from paying our fee since they're already paying towards regional projects in the uh, Fora program. But there are some key differences between the two programs. Um, actually, I'll take these in reverse order from on the, the screen. Um, as uh, Jonathan mentioned with the base reuse plan, there is a, a capped obligations for the, the FORA program. It's uh, inflated right now at about $130 million, uh, but that's what the, the FORA Community Facilities District fee is based on, is that, that capped amount. Whereas with the regional fee program, it's based on the cost of the projects along with the um, percentage that's uh, attributable to new growth. So if we have a, a certain amount of total cost of the projects um, in our fee program and 12% of that cost is attributable to new growth and our program is based off of that 12% of the total project cost. Um, with the uh, FORA program, they also do have uh, obviously on-site projects, whereas our program is uh, focused on the, the regional projects. Um, the, uh, the policy for the FORA board has been to fund the local projects, the on-site projects at 100%. Um, so the, the combination of those two issues, the capped obligations with creating a fixed amount, as well as uh, funding uh, on-site projects at 100%, whereas their nexus contribution may be less than that, is that there's a shift of funding from the regional projects to uh, the on-site projects. Um, as a mellow roost program, that's perfectly allowable, but that is also the, the trade-off with shifting funding from the regional and off-site projects to the on-site. Um, so, uh, looking forward, uh, the transportation agency is, uh, with our regional fee program, uh, legally mandated to update this every five years, and just so happens that we are launching into an update of the program. We just had our kickoff meeting, um, where we will again be looking at the, um, redoing the, the modeling for the program, so looking again at what the potential future uh, travel patterns will be and the uh, needed uh, transportation improvements to serve as mitigations for the program. Um, as I mentioned, we do have FORA as a zone that's currently exempt in our program, but since uh, it's already listed as a zone, we'll be able to run the analysis to see what it could potentially be, what the fees in FORA zone would be if it was fully integrated into our program and developments in the FORA area were to uh, contribute to uh, the regional fee. Um, the uh, FORA transition task force had, uh, recently made a recommendation to uh, transfer, if FORA were to sunset, transfer FORA's obligations to a single entity, JPA. Um, so if uh, there is a legislative extension of FORA or this transfer to the JPA or if potentially FORA were a sun sunset at some point in time, uh, we would still have this analysis from the regional fee program to look at uh, making policy decision to potentially integrate the regional and the offsite projects into the TAMSI program. And so how that would uh, look with uh, just a basic timeline, uh, the four, as I mentioned, the Forward Transition Task Force provided their recommendation at the last August meeting, last meeting in August. Uh, we just recently had our kickoff meeting for the updating the regional uh, development impact fee. I believe four board will be making a recommendation on the Transition Task Force in December. Um, our fee program is, uh, has a deadline to be completed of August of next year. We'll likely have the report completed by uh, May of next year, so well in advance. 
um, of four staff preparing their transition plan in October and then bringing it to the forum board uh, for adoption in next December. Um, so just to kind of give an idea of uh, where, while we are updating our fee program and looking at doing this analysis for all five zones, including the four zone, um, where that will plug into with uh, key decision points coming up uh, down the future. And with that, I believe I'll turn it back to Steve to uh, close up the presentation. Just a few uh, final comments, and then we can turn it over to you for questions, comments, and to the public. The uh, final elements of the presentation uh, have to do with uh, some post-2020 considerations that will be coming back to you from the Transition Task Force, among others, as early as uh, next month. Uh, the staff also has a, a few ideas about leveraging transportation investments that uh, might be a good idea to begin discussing and thinking through. And then finally, I alluded to uh, the work plan for next year, 2018, and uh, we'll just uh, go through that again and uh, let you know what coming attractions are. So uh, coming forward to you uh, next month is a recommendation out of the Transition Task Force to uh, pursue uh, the development of a single entity JPA that uh, would have uh, similar powers, financing powers to FORA. And uh, you know that might take a certain amount of uh, legislative assistance in order to develop that. Uh, the alternative was a multi-agency type format, one of which would be something that would correspond to TAMPSI. Uh, but uh, the decisions uh, will be the boards, and so this is going to be coming to you for a full and uh, robust discussion. The um, bottom line uh, to all this is to ensure the successful completion of the FORA program. If FORA uh, is going to uh, transition in uh, uh, June 30, 2020, uh, the issue of the uh, regional and uh, off-site projects and on-site projects uh, that uh, both Jonathan and uh, Mike have alluded to will have to be uh, discussed and uh, uh, an approach developed as to how to uh, make sure that all of those uh, obligations of uh, FORA are uh, concluded in a satisfactory manner. And uh, Mike also just discussed to some extent uh, the differences between uh, what the FORA program currently uh, operates on and what a single entity JPA uh, would operate on versus a nexus-based approach that uh, TAMSI operates on. And I guess just to summarize, uh, we'll be going through this again next month. Uh, the basic concept behind the Mellow Ruse, which is a not a nexus-based approach, is that it allows you to uh, do base-wide overall funding for infrastructure without having to do a nexus to a very specific project. It allows you more flexibility in the ability to finance and also uh, is weighted uh, towards uh, job creation and uh, the uh, economic uh, incentives in that aspect. And uh, there's also an issue of the fair and equitable treatment of those who are paying the fee. If we change uh, essentially uh, the rules of the game, you will have had some developers and other uh, entities pay their development fees under one system and then uh, those at the end sort of the non-entitled projects would be paying under a different set of rules so that's something that uh, the board will have to wrestle with and, and think through. Moving to uh, some leveraging investments concepts uh, Jonathan pointed out that uh, under the 2017 uh, fee reallocation uh, added to the project list is the uh, Second Avenue Del Monte extension. Uh, there may be some opportunities there to, because, because in order to extend uh, that project, uh, there has to be some building removal that would take place that would allow for a roadway to uh, uh, be put in as well. So 
it, uh, in an interesting way, may provide some uh, opportunities to leverage land sale and CFD dollars and, and maybe get more bang for the buck. There has also been a lot of discussion and conversation uh, both at uh, the jurisdictional levels and, and at the regional levels about various financing options. State of California, of course, has uh, added uh, some financing options that uh, the jurisdictions can make use of, and we're happy uh, to work together with the jurisdictions in that area. And there's also uh, some potential to explore uh, the ability to take existing 4 revenue streams and uh, look at some financing options. So I would suggest that uh, we do some more work on that in the next year. And uh, then uh, finally, uh, th uh, we've been pursuing uh, some uh, options relative to Davis Road south of Blanco. Uh, a Caltrans grant is in the works for uh, reimbursements uh, would provide perhaps the local match. So there are things that we can do. And uh, the general ethos is to uh, be aggressive at doing reuse no matter uh, what kind of time uh, is left to do so. Then uh, the, the transportation work plan uh, for 2018, the major things that you're going to see coming before you, we already did a little uh, rendition of this for the uh, county's, uh, for the County Board of Supervisors uh, Fort Ord Committee yesterday. Uh, the Eastside Parkway CEQA program is set to come forward next year. Uh, just to summarize, what would be coming to this board would be uh, draft goals and objectives that would guide the process. This would be a board decision, so it would come to the board first. And uh, there, there was a suggestion at the committee yesterday that uh, we also uh, allow for public input into that process, which uh, we think is quite doable. Then once those goals and objectives are agreed upon by the board, then under CEQA, the um, process would be that a notice of preparation uh, would be issued and uh, a number of scoping meetings would take place, which ultimately then would lead to a public review draft and EIR uh, that most of you are familiar with going out onto the street with the usual amounts of and, and perhaps even more amounts of public participation uh, in different uh, localities at different times of day and uh, weekends and so on. And uh, then uh, in addition to that, just the, the normal uh, annual CIP process will continue with uh, revenue projections and it, the administrative committee following the process that Jonathan outlined. We would expect to get before you in uh, April, May uh, with a draft CIP with hope of adoption by the end of the fiscal year in June. So that, uh, Chair, is uh, the end of our formal presentation. Thank you, Steve, and thank you, Mike, for a, a very nice presentation, very informative, and um, I think it's going to help us make decisions in the future. At this time, I will take comments and questions uh, from the board. Uh, this is a non-action item, so we'll be very liberal with, uh, with que questions or comments. Don't everybody go at once. Okay, uh, Supervisor Park. Um, so my first question actually is for uh, Mike Zeller. Um, I, I have some concerns. You raised, you had a slide that showed Fora's um, share of um, Davis Road, Highway 156, um, Highway 1, uh, I believe, as well as I think Highway 68, but that one's been taken care of. So um, so I have concerns that um, f we at Fora may not be funding um, these um, sufficiently um, since they're, they're mitigations for development and quite a bit of, well, a certain amount of development has already happened. Uh, I guess uh, my, my question is, uh, my understanding is that by FORA prioritizing on-site um, roads, that that we're currently not allocating funds to um, any of these. Uh, I saw that 
um, the Davis Road um, reservation, you know, between reservation and Blanco was at 100% of environmental, so maybe ready to go. I guess it's, you know, kind of a a set of questions um, that may focus mostly on that Davis Road uh, thing, but I guess I'm wondering, does TAMSI, am I correct in my characterization that FORA may not be, we may not be putting money into a fund to help move those things along in the near term, and uh, what are TAMSI's thoughts on that, and do you have any suggestions for how we might approach this um, differently to make sure that we're fulfilling our obligations uh, for some of these mitigations? Um, well, my understanding is um, that's with the uh, on-site projects being um, funded at 100% uh, of the um, program, and when FOR goes through their prioritization process of the projects, that's the opportunity for the FOR board to set when projects would receive um, the amount of uh, you know, distribution of CFD revenues. Um, that's uh, the, up to the four board discretion as to how to set those priorities for funding those projects. Um, but it is uh, correct uh, characterization that the, primarily the funding has been going towards the um, on-site projects, um, uh, at least in the, the near term. Uh, the Davis Road project for the, the County of Monterey is uh, very near to, to being ready to go and would uh, be looking to use its portion of the, the four fees as well to bring that project forward. So as a follow-up, we could, uh, the FORA board could at the next look at the CIP, if, if things were really ready to go on Davis Road and the FORA funds were needed, w the board, if, if we wanted to, could move the allocation forward in time um, from where it's currently projected? Is that well, not to speak for four staff, but uh, it, my understanding that yes, it's the four board's prior ability to prioritize the projects, and that would go the same for the regional projects as well to bring those forward as they become ready to make sure that um, funding is set aside for those projects as well. Great, thanks. So the comment that follows that then is I think as a board we want to think carefully um, about this, that um, there are... Um, you know, requirements in CEQA that we have, and uh, for one thing, that we want to make sure we're fulfilling, but also, I think, um, you know, we've been fortunate the last few years, we have quite a bit of development happening, and so there's money flowing in, um, but I would have concerns uh, if we're not finding a way to look at the, uh, some of these um, off-site uh, improvements that are part of our mitigation plan, um, finding ways to fund those, that um, we could be um, jeopardizing those projects and also kind of falling short. Um, so I, I would ask us as a board to keep an eye on this and also uh, for staff to, um, you know, help us find options to make sure that some of these uh, things are um, are funded. The, the, the impacts are already happening in many of these locations because development has happened and so I, I would hate to have us putting money in a pot for some development that might happen in um, 10 or 15 years and missing opportunities to take care of our obligations that are, you know, that are current. Um, and then I just wanted to bring up, you mentioned, um, you didn't, um, Steve did, uh, the East Side Parkway. We did have a discussion about this um, yesterday at the Ford Ord Committee, and I really appreciated staff's willingness to consider um, public participation. One of the things that just in the discussion yesterday that I heard was that um, people have different ideas about what the East Side Parkway is for. So the discussion that we are going to be having in, uh, I think you said November, um, about the, the goals and objectives is going to be really critical because if we, if it is to be a way to have people move more expeditiously between the peninsula and Salinas and vice versa, that, that's one, that's one layout and project. If it is a road to help people within the Fort Ord developments move around uh, within Fort Ord or get just sort of where they need to go just outside, that's a very different road. Um, and so I think before we embark on uh, doing a lot of work to analyze it, we need to figure out what it is we're trying to do and, and be clear about it. And I, think, um, and I think having a discussion with the public 
in advance of our discussion of that would be very helpful um, for two reasons. One is I think there is similar, um, and I just mentioned two ideas. There may be uh, several others, but to get an idea of what people are thinking and wanting um, and making sure that's part of our presentation to the board in um, when it comes to us because the alternative is that then the public will show up and be very worried about what we're trying to do and it's going to take us a long time to have have the discussion. I think it would be helpful for us to be informed by what the public's thinking and to have them know that they've been listened to to a certain extent already. So just um, really want to put in a plug for having that kind of input as part of the presentation that comes to us in, in November. And I appreciate you saying that that is, seems to be a um, feasible notion. Thank you. So just um, Jonathan, in his slides, referenced the 2012 reassessment when you went through everything historically. and. Just a question that I had was, was the traffic, anything about these roads and the CIP addressed in the reassessment and making recommendations for some change or alterations? It was never brought before PRAC in that way, the post-reassessment committee. And so because it's here now, I have a question if that is the case. Uh, the reassessment did look at, um, in a broad sense, what the, the CIP, how it differentiated between the base reuse plan. So it just noted, um, for example, at uh, Light Fighter and General Jim Moore Boulevard, uh, that uh, the base reuse plan originally had Second Avenue connecting to General Jim Moore Boulevard, but because of Army easement issues, Light Fighter is the connection between Second Avenue and General Jim Moore Boulevard. So it looked at, in specific detail, little um, changes along the road like that that occurred because of rights of way acquisition and things of that nature. So it pointed out cleanup things that needed to occur both in the mapping or in the wording, but not any policy direction or guidance. Would that be correct? Well, the policy direction and guidance was about conducting another reallocation study, which was completed last year. And then just for the edification, going back to your slide, 15, where you're talking about the capital improvement projects. So our, the money that we generate for our capital improvement projects are going to be allocated primarily between blight removal, transportation, and the habitat management plan. Is that true? Yes. Okay. And so it's a policy decision, meaning it can be changed by the board, that land sales revenues, uh, currently we apply those to blight removal first, and then any excess <coughs> would go into the community facility district roads, transportation, or some other use, correct? Correct. And does it work in the reverse, that the community facility district special tax, that funding there can be applied towards blight removal. No, when the community facilities district was set up, um, it put a notice of special tax on all of Fort Ord and it listed which improvements it would apply for. And so it listed the traffic, uh, the transit, the water augmentation, the habitat management. But uh, blight removal at the time was not an eligible use of the Melarus district CFD funds. So it wasn't among the list. And so currently under Melarus law, could we impose a facility district, seek that as approval, or modify the existing one to include blight removal under current law? And maybe that's a legal question. I, since he's indicating it <coughs> was not a legal option at the time, and I thought it was a board decision. So that's what I'm trying to get into. Uh, we can take a look at that. Um, okay. I would say it's not likely. Any amendment would require an election. Correct. Of but that if, sort. It's an, if it's something that is an option that can be voted on versus that the law precludes that it can even be considered. That's right. one is 
optional and the other is no. And I'm trying to understand no, what, what, where I, the flexibility <coughs> is. And, and this is the right. outgrowth of the last workshop that we had where what had been a $54 million blight problem after forest sunsets now is estimated to be a $100 million problem. And I'm trying to see, I think part of this discussion is prioritizing our funds both from land sales and the CFD to accomplish the greatest good for the region. And so that's the point of these questions, is understanding what authority we have as we're exploring in follow-up to the policy decisions that Supervisor Parker was just asking to address. I'm trying to ask us, what can we do to step back even further than not just looking solely road A, road B, CIP. Yeah. So that was so staff uh, will work with council to take a look at that. We we have the questions been asked and we have done the research in the past. We may want to reprise the work we had before and just double check it. Thank you. Um, in regards to the regional obligations of fora to fund uh, you know, 156 and 68 and some of the others. That number comes from a full build-out uh, consideration. Uh, is that correct? <coughs> yes. The, okay. the 2017 reallocation study looked at uh, the transportation network in, 20, in 2035. Okay. So assuming that the population growth and job growth happens in 2035, what transportation system can accommodate that growth? So then we have to be very cognizant of what what level of that full build out we're at um, and make sure that we're funding at that level rather than you know putting more money into that that would maybe outstrip what we actually do um, so that's that's a consideration we have to think about when we have that discussion because we don't want to over overfund it if we're not going to reach that production um, and in terms of um, when we talk about uh, Eastside Parkway, I think one of the first questions we have to ask is what does the EIR, what is the expectation of the, of the uh, EIR on the, uh, the role, what that purpose of that road is? Uh, because I know that the traffic counts were based on, on moving um, the peninsula traffic to Salinas and back and forth. Of course, it's going to also serve as an interior road for those folks that are around it. But I think the, the original uh, premise in the EIR was that it was a regional serving a transportation corridor and, and the base reuse plan. So um, I think we have to make sure that we connect to the original documents to make sure that we don't get too far away from that because that will determine um, what we do with our, our mitigations. And the mitigations, I feel, inside the base uh, will help us uh, meet those goals for the regional uh, implications as well. The, the major roads, uh, such as Eastside Parkway, uh, will, will help mitigate some of that uh, traffic on 68 and Highway 1 and Reservation Road and the traffic going through Marina and through CSUMB, which are very, you know, very serious considerations. If there's no other questions or comments from the board, I will open it to the public. Three minutes. Good afternoon. My name is Jason Campbell. I'm a council member of Seaside. I'm also happen to be an alternate on this board, but I'd love to have an opportunity to sit there sometime, to tell you the truth. Um, I want to talk about two, I only have time, I think, to talk about two projects, and that's the Eastside Parkway and the Highway 1 uh, interchange improvement, and I think they're very related. I was happy to see a map shown earlier on 7. It's very close to a map I wanted to make you all aware of. It's from the base reuse plan, um, figure 4.2-3. It shows the original um, traffic outline, and if you look closely at it, it's a pretty simple map. It has no Eastside Parkway. So I want to be sure that um, 
There's kind of a story out there that the uh, Eastside Parkway is part of the original base reuse plan or stems from it. It really does not. You just need to look at the map and see that it's not part of the base reuse plan. Um, and I, I, don't, I don't want you to, I want to avoid making decisions on, on things that just aren't quite accurate. One of the, um, but I would like to make decisions based on accurate and significant facts. And I haven't found those yet for um, the current alignment of the East Side Parkway. Um, I can tell you why it shouldn't be aligned the way it is. As a resident of Seaside, we are facing a major traffic issue because of development in Fort Ord. We've been talking about mitigation here at the um, Monterey Road. And the Seaside Islands, part of, part of the former Fort Ord, and a lot of military bases, um, Presidio Monterey, and of course for the school, that's all getting impacted worse and worse. The current alignment of the, the preferred alignment of the East Side Parkway, which again is not part of the original base reuse plan, terminates at the top of Co Road, which leads directly into Monterey Road. So not only is Fora not dealing with an issue that has already been created by development, but they're actually proposing to make it worse by spending lots of money on that. I saw a slide here on, on leveraging, and 17 million, it looked like, would be for a share for um, the Highway 1 improvement, and we'd get a lot more bang for the buck out of that. So I, I really urge you all to, um, to take a good hard look at the um, Eastside Parkway and, the, and what would be the best priority. How can we save money? Uh, there's lots of reroutes that are possible. And um, I like that uh, quote, be aggressive doing reuse. There's a lot of roads here we can reuse and mitigate a lot of the issues that uh, Eastside Parkway is trying to solve. Thank you. Hi, George Riley. Um, I'm going to have a hard time explaining this, I believe. All well, my three minutes are going to take up just trying to get out of my head what I'm thinking. Um, I would hope that this group would reevaluate. It's what um, Director uh, Morton just mentioned. Um, reevaluate the use of the facilities uh, fund, the community facilities uh, district funding. Um, if it's discretionary to add blight removal to that, then what are the steps in order to consider doing that? The question was raised about an election. I'm just curious if there's an answer right now. Is this a population-based, voter-based election, or is it property-based election? Is, is, there, is that known? Uh, voter. Voter, OK. Um, but my point is, if it were submitted to a vote, who can you imagine would vote against it? Because the subject is removing blight. It would be the easiest thing that you could get on the ballot, and seemed to me the easiest thing you could pass, if you decide to use that money in a more discretionary way about addressing blight. The second thing I wanted to say is that the blight seems to be largely concentrated along the existing transportation corridors. And as the blight presents a visual dilemma, I think, to any proposed development, a developer, um, that forces the developer to look farther inland and therefore forces the environmental uh, impacts that are more uh, substantial because the corridor, the transportation corridors that serve the blight area already exist. There may need to be some improvements around it, but the transportation access to the properties that contain the blight is already in place with minimum improvements that are needed. So it seems to me you get the maximum bang for your buck if you concentrate on the, on the corridors that already exist largely around the blighted area including removing blight, and then you create land for development with minimum investment to remove the very heartache that exists with Fora. And then you can move forward, I think, in a, in a rational way. The, the last thing I wanted uh, to mention is that if there's new funding available, new funding tools, the EI, FD, and the CRIA are also in the mill in, in the process. Hopefully, you can see how you get the maximum bang for the combined, 
combined buck. Right now, you've, you've created the dilemma of not being able to address blight until there's development. And you can, I think, increase the likelihood of development with some of these other front-end transportation corridor related improvements to make that happen. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my name is Lane Long. I'm city manager with Marina. As I watched this, this uh, presentation, and I would concur that blight uh, really should be a top priority because when blight goes, we're able to uh, create the economic development. Uh, but as I was looking at that, I was wondering regarding the regional uh, uh, impact fee. And so right now, the CFD has it exempt for the former for, for the Fort Ord properties. Does that have to be exempt right now, or, or can you fold that in right now and have the regional tax uh, pick up the Fort Ord properties? And the reason I, that I say that is every morning, I take my daughters to Monterey High School. We have to leave by 6.58. So this week, I left at 6.58. I can get to Monterey High School in 12 to 15 minutes, drop her out without having to come to a stop. I turn around and come directly back. 7.20 it is gridlock solid from Highway 1 all the way to Del Monte Avenue and Marina, Imogen Parkway. Now it's solid all the way back to 2nd Avenue, 3rd Avenue. Now it's California and it's starting to go beyond California to Imogen. This is not local traffic generated by the developments. This is all regional traffic. And so what we're saying by the presentation was the CFD um, it said it, get, the reason it's set up that way, it's flexible. It gives the ability to take the money from where it's generated and, and spread it to the whole district. But the problem is, is we don't have enough money. And so if we shifted the uh, regional development tax right now to pick up the Fort Ord transportation projects, the money that you have in the CFD, that frees up money to allocate towards the other projects, the transit, um, some transportation, the HCP, the water augmentation. So would that not free up a lot more money and potentially if you get blight, that's another avenue to blight. So I say, why wait now to shift it to regional? Why don't we do it right now or not wait till after 2020? Thank you. Okay. Any other public comments? Thanks. I'm Eric Morgan with the Fort Ord National Monument. Uh, and many of you may have had a, a letter from us in your board packet, but I just kind of wanted to address uh, Eastside Parkway. And I really appreciate uh, Supervisor Parker's comments about everybody's kind of looking at Eastside Parkway, and if you have different interests or visions for it, it could serve a totally different purpose, which I couldn't uh, agree more. That was an excellent comment to make. Uh, so the Fora Board is very well that, or very well aware that Eastside Parkway is fairly controversial. And so we really appreciate that FORA is kind of backing out, looking at CEQA alternatives and options and trying to figure out exactly what's needed for Eastside Parkway. As you know, BLM was engaged with FORA in the early conceptual planning of Eastside Parkway with California State University of Monterey Bay sometime around 2005. Our agency envisioned a regional transportation connector that was north of the monument and Cal State University of Monterey Bay envisioned that connector being south of their campus. That conceptual transportation planning in 2005 was also mindful avoiding lands designated as habitat in the habitat management plan. So as you now look at alternatives and analyze uh, options for Eastside Parkway, please keep in mind these two opportunities. There is a need for a gateway to the National Monument on the north side of the National Monument. There are two BLM trailheads on the southeast near State Route 68, but no managed trailheads to the north. There's also an opportunity to integrate regional motorized and non-motorized routes, such as the Fortag route. And finally, consider passage across the transportation systems by wildlife and recreationists to open space. So if it's planned correctly, and I think you can pr plan this correctly, the transportation corridor can accomplish all of the above and provide a needed traffic relief for State Route 68 and Highway 1. If all the transportation network, if the transportation network improves access to the National Monument and includes developed trailheads as part of its design, perhaps it can be called Monument Parkway 
or Gateway Avenue, because apparently Eastside Parkway is a pretty dirty word. Okay? Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other comments? Okay, I'll bring it back. I'll just make a couple of observations. One that the, you know, the East Side Parkway alignment has been something that has been in discussion since the base use plan came about. Uh, there have been a lot of negotiations on realignment, uh, including uh, losing the Highway 68, 68 bypass and the the Fort Ord Expressway to uh, stay away from the, the sensitive areas and through negotiation, the, the new alignment or that general area was, was agreed upon. Um, of course, you know, boards change and people forget some of the, uh, the things that went on. But uh, the original idea was to totally bypass uh, from 68 all the way over to Reservation Road, uh, which is, you know, that's pretty ambitious. But the um, Eastside uh, Parkway dumps down into General Jim Moore. That's, that's the regional uh, road that it connects to. If someone wants to do go down Co Avenue, then they're, they're, taking their <laughs> they're taking their chances on getting where they want to go. But the idea is to connect that regional road of uh, General Jim Moore to the uh, regional connectors. Uh, to the north. Uh, so, um, that being said, are there any final comments? Yes. Sure. Thanks, Mr. Chair. You you um, mentioned something uh, previously in your comments about you know being careful to balance uh, the amount of investment we're making uh, with uh, kind of the level of existing development, and and I think that's a good point. It would be interesting. Uh, in uh, sometimes it's laid out in. Uh, in the plans that uh, when we've reached, um, you know, 30% of build out, um, such and, you know, such and such amount of investment will have been made in the regional impacts when we get to 50% so much. And they're kind of benchmarks for that. And, and we don't have that here at Fora. So that might be something to consider as we, as we go forward to make sure that we're hitting, uh, you know, a balance that's, um, that makes sense. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Uh, just a very quick uh, point. I don't think there's anybody in this room that does not want to get rid of the um, the uh, blight that we have in, in Seaside and Marina. We're all for that. I think everybody in this room, and especially the board, wants to meet our obligations with regard to regional transportation, construction, and so forth. We want to be a good partner. I think everybody in this room wants to meet our obligation with regard to the uh, obligations the Habitat Conservation Plan we negotiated with the Sierra Club many years ago. The problem is we have limited funds. Uh, the Transition Task Force, we're looking at the funds that are required to, to close everything out by 2020. We really have unlimited funds. I guess the only point I want to make is it's a zero-sum game. You take money out of one pot and put it in another pot, that first pot you pull it out of is, is short funds. So if we're looking at uh, trying to come up with additional funds, we can't look at it in a microcosm. We have to look at it in a, a broad context to see exactly what the impacts will be with all the pots we're dealing with. It's not going to be easy. It's going to be hard. I do applaud the idea of looking at for more funds for uh, the blight removal, but we've got to be really careful we don't uh, rob Peter to pay Paul. I, I just want to respond to that. Um, I want to be sure that everybody understands we agree, Jerry, it is robbing Peter to pay Paul. There's no doubt about it. If you have $100 and you spend $30 on roads and $60 on the habitat management, you have $10 for blight removal in that $100. If you shift the combination, that is what happens. The discussion of why we had this workshop about blight, I think, is to get a better understanding of the totality of the amount of money to weigh against that hundred dollars that we have and to see if it's better appropriation to put different percentages to each of these in these items that need to be completed with the with the focus on which is going to achieve the best economic growth sooner and which is the most <coughs> critical need today and making sure that we're not just doing things that are going to serve us in 2050, 
but serve the needs of the region today in 2017. And I think to Council Member um, Campbell's point about Monterey Road, to the supervisor's point, I think she's the one that made the point about Davis Road, is that Marina has these intersection congestions that no matter what we do internally on the base, until we address these intersection failures, we're not going to have the smooth movement of transportation. And Blight, our economic development director, stands up every quarter and tells us the Blight is an impediment that when he's meeting with people coming into our community to invest their economic dollars is a detriment. And so that is the argument. Not that we think there's all these new sources of money but that as a board in these policies that were set in 1998, in 2000, and 2005, that us, as leaders sitting here, need to listen to our constituents and decide, are these the priorities that best fit us in 2017 and achieve the goals and the best plan through 2050? That's what I'm asking for. Mr. Moore. Uh, just oh, I'm sorry, Dr. Moore. <laughs> whatever, call me Tom. Um, so just a little bit of a follow-up. It seems to me that in the state of California, cities and other government agencies for years have dealt with transportation infrastructure. So there's lots of law, there's lots of mechanisms for improving transportation infrastructure. Perhaps in more recent years, the same could be said about habitat conservation, existing mechanisms. Um, on the other hand, I'm not so sure that very many places in the state have dealt with blight removal, and probably very few have dealt with blight removal on the scale that FORA has had to deal with it. So FORA has had to, in some ways, be kind of unique in coming up with some mechanisms to deal with uh, blight removal. Those mechanisms, as you're struggling with them in the transition task force could potentially go away with FORA going away. On, on the other hand, the, the law and the systems for building new transportation infrastructure or dealing with habitat conservation exist and will continue to go on. So in terms of how you decide to cut up this fixed pie of dollars, you may want to look at what would easily be easier to do later on and survive as opposed to things that are going to be harder to do uh, and I have a bad feeling that blight removal might very well be one of them uh, once Fora goes away. Okay, so there being no further comments, we'll go ahead and move the agenda on to, uh, and I want to thank everybody for their comments and the public for their comments uh, to flesh this whole thing out. Uh, our next item is closed session, uh, and I'll have our authority council read us in. Thank you, Chair, members of the board and public. Uh, we will adjourn to court, uh, closed session for item 5A, conference with legal counsel, government code section 54956.9A, keep Fort Ord wild versus Fort Ord Re reuse authority.
closed session. Read the results, please. Thank you, Chair. Uh, members of the board and public, uh, the board met in closed session under item uh, 5A, conference with legal counsel, government code section 54956.9A, keep Fort Ord Wild versus Fort Ord Reuse Authority. Uh, heard from counsel uh, about the status of the, of the current litigation, and there's nothing to report out. Okay, thank you. The next item is roll call. Supervisor Parker. Here. Supervisor Adams. Here. Supervisor Phillips. Here. Mayor Edelin. Councilmember O'Connell. Councilmember Morton. Here. Councilmember Hoffa. Here. Mayor Rubio. Here. Councilmember Alexander. Here. Mayor Carbone. Here. Mayor Gunter. Here. Councilmember Garfield. Here. Councilmember Jan, Jan Reimers. Here. Anthony Musa. Uh, here. Nicole Charles. Here. Erica Parker. Here. Debbie Hale. Here. Dr. Diffenbaugh. Here. Steve Matarazzo. Dr. Ochoa, Here. Hugh Hardin, Here. Bill Collins, Here. Dr. Tribley, Here. Lisa Reinheimer, Here. and Dr. Moore. Here. You have a quorum. Thank you. Okay, the next uh, item is a consent agenda, which consists of approved August 11, 2017 meeting minutes, legislative committee appointment, veterans issue advisory committee, public correspondence to the board, transition task force update, an executive officer report. Is there anyone on the dais who would like to pull anything for further consideration? <coughs> I'm sorry? E A E, thank you. Uh, any others? Anybody in the public? All right, I'll consider. The motion is second to approve the remainder of the consent agenda. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Okay, uh, so item E. Use your microphone, please. as I am to speaking into a microphone. Um, uh, there was a little bit of confusion at the end of the meeting, um, after the meeting, about what we really had voted on. And I just wanted to make sure that we said it in a public forum that the motion that was made and passed was not a motion to extend FORA. Correct. So I just wanted that to be made public and to ensure that it went into the minutes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So, so may I ask a follow-up question? Sure. So at the time of the meeting, my recollection was that we were asking, the motion asked also for the tax increment to continue beyond FORA and be directed towards this entity, be it a JPA. Whatever JPA or whatever multi-agency. So it would be the CFD and the tax increment, and the tax increment would require legislative action. Both would, yes. Okay, thank you. Any other questions or comments on this item? Offering the public. Seeing none, I'll entertain a motion to approve. Okay, all those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you very much. Uh, the next item is a business item. Mr. Hulamard. Uh, yes, uh, Chair and uh, members of the board and public. Um, this item, uh, last night we received a letter from uh, the Stamp Erickson Law Firm, and um, it outlines some uh, issues and concerns, objections and concerns uh, about the item uh, based on the Brown Act and on CEQA uh, requirements. Uh, I've taken a look at the letter. Um, I'm not in f uh, full agreement with some of the concerns or objections uh, to this item. However, um, in an abundance of caution and um, just to make sure that we're communicating with uh, the public appropriately and uh, addressing concerns, I, I'm recommending that we pull this item for this, this, this month. Okay, is there so does that require a motion? Uh, I think it would be good for us to uh, have a motion to continue to the next meeting. 
Okay, so I'll move that we continue it to the next meeting. Next regular meeting. Second. There's a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Okay, uh, we have now come to the public comment period. May I ask a follow-up question on that? So, for the next meeting, yesterday at 3.39, uh, we got a document that's like 25 pages to read. Is that the actual document now that we will be considering at the next meeting? The contract language, is this it? It came last night, September 7th, email 339 to all of us. And I just want to I just want to know what I need to review. And that I have plenty of time to do it, and as does the public, that they know also right. while we're in this meeting to make it clear. Now, Peter, there was a transmittal that went out on Tuesday to the full board, right? That's correct. We sent out on Tuesday um, the contract and the service work order language. Uh, between Tuesday and yesterday, there were additional responses in which we changed some of that language. I have provided a memorandum of what language was changed uh, in, in three points within the contracts. And then we sent out the contract and service work order again last night. So what you have currently is uh, the changes included, and it is the full document. As of September 7th. 7th, that's correct. Okay. Right. So I'm just trying to make that clear right. also for the public, because that was part of the content of the objection was they didn't have things to review. Right. So we, I'm, I'm not going to, as, uh, just as your executive officer, I'm not going to say this is the final document you'll get next month. But as I said, we noti noticed it last week. We sent out the original contract with all the documents on Tuesday. We received comments from the same folks that had other comments. Um, we adjusted accordingly. It felt they made a good positive comment, so we adjusted it for the board Senate yesterday. Next month, we may look at some further revisions if we get more comments. Understood. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, let's go ahead and uh, open up for public comment. Three minutes, please. Seeing none, we'll bring it back. Items from members. Okay, then we'll, we'll go ahead and adjourn until our next regular meeting. <laughs>